The Higher Ed Marketer Podcast is sponsored by the Zemi app, enabling colleges and universities to engage interested students before they even apply. You're listening to The Higher Ed Marketer, a podcast geared towards marketing professionals in higher education. This show will tackle all sorts of questions related to student recruitment, donor relations, marketing trends, new technologies, and so much more. If you're looking for conversations centered around where the industry is going, this podcast is for you. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the Higher Ed Marketer Podcast, where each week, myself, Troy Singer, and Bart Kaler interview higher ed marketers that we admire for the betterment of the entire higher ed marketing community. Today, we get to go into the conversation of if you could start it all from scratch with Dr. Michael Rice, who will be the Director of Admissions for the Osteopathic Medical School at Duquesne University. Currently, he is at the Osteopathic Medical School at Ohio University. And we felt it would be fascinating to talk to someone that is going to go to a school that is not in existence and that they are creating and will not be matriculating students until 2024. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating because I mean, very, very seldom does a does a major school like this come on board and 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 be introduced like this. I really love a lot of the reasons why they're starting the medical school, and we'll get into that and and the opportunities that that presents for them, and as well as the prospective students, but also just kind of the uh, the, the the humbling essence of being in that role and you know coming in on July of, of twenty two and then spending you know the first year kind of figuring out the mechanics of how to do the marketing, the recruiting and all that. And then, you know, getting going, you know, the fall, the, the summer of 23 to get ready for the fall of 24. So long process, but I think it's pretty exciting to hear some of the ideas that Dr. Rice has and, uh, and how he's approaching that challenge, uh, especially in kind of a, a new way of thinking about everything. So great episode. Yes, I agree, Bart. Here's our conversation with Dr. Michael Rice. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Rice, Director of Admissions for the Osteopathic Medical School at Duquesne University to the Higher Ed Marketer Podcast. Dr. Rice, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, being completely transparent, when we first approached Dr. Rice, it was about another topic, but he is now transitioning to a wonderful new opportunity for him, which also changed the subject of our podcast topic. Dr. Rice, can you give us a little bit about what your future opportunity is? Certainly. You know, uh, the opportunity, uh, the next chapter of my professional career is uh, with the proposed uh, Osteopathic Medical School with Duquesne University. Uh, it's an exciting challenge. Um, to be involved from the ground up is, is both exciting and daunting. You know, the good people of Duquesne, from the president to the provost to the executive dean of the NUCOM, they all have been very welcoming and very supportive of a lot of the things that I do here at Ohio University Heritage College. Something that is uh, specific to the mission of Duquesne that will carry over to the medical school is serving underserved populations. Uh, there are many underserved populations uh, around the state or around the city of uh, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Western PA, uh, rural, and uh, there are some urban pockets that uh, are grossly underserved. And so the mission of Duquesne's pending medical school is uh, serving those underserved populations and recruiting students who have the heart of service, the heart of servitude, if you will. And so that's something that is speak that speaks to the, the mission of the founding fathers of Duquesne University, and that will definitely be carried uh, forward uh, in, uh, in the uh, medical school in terms of this mission and how we go about recruiting our students and faculty and admin. Uh, that's uh, my charge, my um, my mission is uh, from from the very top of the institution is to recruit uh, folks who want to be about the uh, business of servitude and serving those who are less fortunate, and also 
uh, recruiting a class, faculty, and staff that are uh, reflective of society. Part of that, uh, which is something that uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, be involved with uh, greatly here at HCOM is making sure that there are pathway opportunities, access and opportunity for black and brown students who have been, or populations that have been marginalized in rural settings uh, in the med school admissions. And so those are exciting. Uh, those are my mandates as uh, have been given to me. And I'm excited about the challenge uh, slash opportunity uh, that uh, Duquesne is going to uh, present. That's great. I appreciate you kind of uh, giving us a little bit of a, a context to this conversation, Dr. Rice. And I'm just curious, I know that um, this is the second uh, new medical school that I've heard bring, come on in the last couple of years. I mean, one I'm familiar with is another Catholic institution here in Indianapolis, Marion University that launched their medical school probably about uh, nine or 10 years ago. But I'm, I'm curious, where did the idea come from this? And certainly I think out of the, out of the Catholic tradition that you described the idea of service, but I mean, is there a, is there a, a, a specific need that the school kind of identified and, and uh, tell me a little bit about kind of the, the, the ideation of where this medical school came from. Mm -hmm. You know, as I understand it, it was something that has been discussed uh, many, many years uh, uh, in the making. The carrying of the spirit and tradition of Duquesne uh, and service to underserved populations of Western uh, PA, uh, not only of, uh, of the state of Pennsylvania, but nationally and from a global perspective. So I'm aware that many, many years ago, there had been in the works to uh, build and partner with local entities, if you will, uh, to build a medical school at Duquesne. Um, for whatever reason, those uh, 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 plans uh, uh, were laid aside and at the appropriate time, they were picked up and brought uh, uh, forward and, and coming to fruition. You know, I'm a firm believer that everything has a season. Um, it might not have been the right season for Duquesne to launch its medical school many years ago, but now the timing, the opportunity, and the stakeholders that uh, are necessary to undertake such a daunting, uh, such an awesome task. It's, it's, it's time. It's the, it's the season. That's great. And I, and I find that, uh, I'm so respective of that and, and, and of you and the other leaders that are on the team that, um, you know, basically coming in and, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, you've got these, uh, the Avenger team coming together and, and, you know, taking on something bigger than, than any of you have done before. And I think that we'll get into a little bit more in the conversation about kind of everything starting from scratch. But I, I mean, personally, how does it feel for you? I mean, you're coming in, you know, getting ready to recruit for fall of 20, uh, 23. So we're, we're a year out. You're going to start in, in July and, and get, get going to recruit for, for the following year. There's, I mean, personally, that's going to be kind of exciting to kind of be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm getting ready to uh, kind of uh, do something on the, on the front end of something. It is very exciting. Uh, also very humbling. Um, you know, I don't come to this position thinking that um, uh, it's going to be an easy task. Uh, I don't come to this position thinking that I have all of the answers in terms of the recruitment process and the right dynamic in terms of formulating the exact uh, uh, team necessary to undertake this measure. So it's, it's, it's exciting to be on the front end, um, but also I'm cognizant of the fact that out of all the comms, out of all the osteopathic medical schools, I think I might be the only African-American male that would be director of admissions. Mm. And so uh, I know from the osteopathic association, there is there are concerted efforts in terms of some di diversity and inclusion initiatives. Right. You know, I, I, I take with uh, some bit of uh, so sobriety in terms of uh, realizing that this is a very big position. Uh, it has the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, be generational, uh, uh, have generational effects in terms of uh, serving some of those underserved uh, Western Pennsylvanians that do not have access to quality health care. Also, generational change of uh, uh, students who might be first gen uh, coming into the medical profession. So this has an opportunity to be both transformative and to provide generational change uh, to many families that 
we just wouldn't be able to count. They could be as numerous as the stars uh, themselves because yeah. uh, you affect uh, uh, folks in the Hill District uh, who may not have trust of doctors. Mm -hmm. And you're going to uh, build community and relations and trust. Uh, and then you begin recruiting students from those areas, uh, from the outlying rural areas. Again, those same rural folks may not have access to quality health care. Uh, they may not uh, have that trust factor, but the opportunity to go in with a team to establish those trust lines of community, faith and foundation, I think um, are exciting. But, 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 I, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fact that um, there's, there's going to be a lot of first right. uh, for someone in this, in this position. I'm honored, um, but uh, uh, very humble at the same time. That's great. Dr. Rice, would love to talk about some of the tactics and the strategy that you will uh, use to achieve your goals and to approach those underserved communities and to convince the people in the Hill District that they can trust doctors and they can go to school at Duquesne. So have you given much thought to that this early in the cycle, this early in the process of going into this endeavor? Actually, I have. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, who is the executive dean of the new uh, medical school, he and I have kind of had some uh, uh, extended talks about uh, his vision, our vision, if you will, of how we would like to go about recruiting uh, students who may not think that they have the opportunity to go to medical school to build those trust factors uh, within certain communities. Part of that, uh, in terms of uh, uh, a community-based uh, type of uh, recruitment is, uh, although I no longer have the need for barbershops, I'm gonna go into local barbershops and make them <laughs> aware of, we're here, we're here to stay, and this is our commitment to you and, and, to, and to our community. Um, I wanna go into local churches and synagogues and mosques to give them the same message. Uh, showing that there's a partnership. Uh, we hope to build a synergy around those community-based religious organizations to establish that, that, that open dialogue and that bridge to access an opportunity for those students who may have been marginalized in the past. Um, you know, something Dr. Kaufman has um, uh, talked about in terms of recruiting, you know, what if uh, we took the recruitment uh, along the lines of uh, maybe going into students' homes and sitting down with their parents and having a meal. You don't see that uh, type of recruitment for um, medical schools or other children degree programs. That, that's not really done. But what if uh, we uh, identify this student who is uh, exemplary and we want them uh, at our school because we feel that they fit our mission and we feel that uh, we have a uh, a wonderful education that they can benefit from to uh, be the best that they can be. But what if we went in uh, to their homes and sat down with their mother or their father or their grandma, uh, the Nana or wherever the case may be and said, Hey, we love your son or daughter. We very much like to see them uh, at Duquesne yeah. in our medical school. What do we need to do to make you feel comfortable in choosing us? Because it's a two way street. Uh, we might like you, but you may not like us. Right. Um, so there needs to be a comfort level that from uh, uh, by the parents, knowing that if we recruit your son or daughter to Duquesne, and this is the same thing we do here at HCOM, uh, John Schreiner, Dean Schreiner, and Director Harmon, uh, what we've tried to foster is if we recruit your son or daughter uh, and matriculate your son or daughter, we're going to graduate your son and daughter and care for them as if they were our very own. So a lot of times when I uh, recruit students, first I, I get their permission, but I, I establish that trust where they allow me to speak to them as if I were advising my son or daughter. Right. And if I'm advising my son or daughter, I'm going to give them the best professional advice, whether they want to hear it or not, <laughs> that I have. It may be good information or may be information that stings. Uh, for example, if I'm working with a student and they need to improve on their MCAT, uh, or maybe they need to take a gap year and take a master's uh, program in the biology, biological sciences to enhance their 
uh, GPAs and their profiles. Um, I want to have those honest conversations um, because um, uh, uh, one, uh, the pursuit of, 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 of medical education is, is daunting. Uh, th there's a reason why less than 6% of the U.S. population have DO or MD behind their names. It's because of the challenges. And um, I want to paint a real picture in terms of this is, this is real. This is what you're going to face. It's not, gonna, it's not always going to be pieces and cream, but we're here to help you at every step of the way so that you can get all that you can and to be your very best. That's great. And I, I love a couple of things that you said there that I think apply to a lot of different things beyond just medical school recruitment. But the idea that, you know, building the relationships and actually pursuing students, I think everyone wants that. I mean, we all, I think we all have a sense of, of feeling good that when we build relationships, whether we're, you know, whether we're buying a new car or doing something else, we tend to trust those people who actually care about us and, and they see us. That's so important for all kinds of higher ed marketing and higher ed recruitment that I think sometimes we miss, especially when we get into these, um, you know, so much of our marketing can be automated that we sometimes lose that human touch. And so the idea of sitting down with somebody for dinner seems kind of crazy, but that's where relationships start. Breaking bread with someone is, is kind of a, an ancient tradition that I think builds trust. And I, I love the fact that you guys are even thinking about those types of things. And I have to say that, you know, one of the things that I'm sure a lot of our listeners are thinking about is, wow, what a great opportunity to build something totally from scratch. I mean, you're not having to come in and saying and hearing, oh, we've always done it that way. We're going to keep doing it that way because they've never done it that way. So I, I think that's pretty exciting. And, and I guess one other comment I wanted to make, and I'll just, I'd like to hear your perspective on this, Dr. Rice, is that, you know, and, and I'll, be, I'll be transparent. We talked a little bit about it in the, in the pre-interview. You know, I have a little bit of experience. My, my wife attended uh, and graduated from medical school and, and had a career in, in medicine. Um, I know, you know, 30 years ago when she was looking at schools, uh, there, was a, there was a discrepancy and a misunderstanding, if you will, about, you know, osteopathic medicine and, and, and allopathic medicine with, with the MD versus the DO. Sometimes I think that, that is what I have thought, or, or maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. There's even a level of trust that you have to build up um, historically from some misconceptions and some stereotypes about osteopathic medicine that, that's simply not true. But I'm sure that building the trust in some of these communities and some of these different places, that's going to be part of your challenge as well. Absolutely. When I started 10 years ago, there was more uh, misconceptions and apprehension about uh, an out, uh, osteopathic uh, physician is less than. Right. I think over the last decade or so, the osteopathic uh, associations have done a credible job in uh, uh, marketing osteopathic medicine, its principles, its, its foundation, and uh, establishing the fact that for the most part, if you go to an ER or to a clinic or to hospital, unless you're looking at the, the uh, embroidery on the coat, you're not realizing that you, could, you may have been visited or cared for by a DO or and MD. Right. So I think over the past uh, several years, uh, uh, there has been some better brand awareness, uh, better education uh, of the public, and that also includes better, uh, educating uh, uh, some of those uh, advisors that have been uh, in their stead for many years, and the MD way is the only pathway that they know, and getting to know them and establishing those relationships and also uh, the GME, the graduate medical, medical education programs, uh, those residency programs right. uh, are now one. Uh, that process was uh, uh, that began in 2015 uh, was finalized in the summer of 2020. So the same accrediting body for an MD, so shall it be for the DO. So the residencies are now one. There's no longer just an allopathic or an osteopathic uh, uh, residency. They're all one. And I, and I think those uh, those realizations are going a long way in, in in letting everybody know that an osteopathic physician can 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 be or pursue any type of residency residency or specialty or subspecialty. Right. Regardless if you go to Harvard, Ohio State, or Ohio University Heritage College, 
uh, or University of Cincinnati or University of Michigan, at the end of the day, if you don't have the board scores, it doesn't matter where you where you where you attend the medical school, but if you don't have the board scores that are reminiscent of uh, uh, students being accepted in those programs, it doesn't matter where you go, right. whether you're allopathic or osteopathic. And so I think the key here, Martin Troy, is that making sure that the uh, the pedagogy, the, the 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 curricula within the medical school uh, prepares the students for not only first time board passage, but uh, high board scores. Right. And that's what we've tried to do here at at uh, Heritage College. Uh, we had match day about two weeks ago, two weeks ago today, mm-hmm. and it was a joyous occasion. We were in our atrium in our new facility, and students were uh, uh, getting the good news where they've matched and. Uh, and, and what specialty. Um, and so it's uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of that has to do with the, the front end, recruiting the right student, preparing those all of our students for success in the classroom and those standardized exams and making sure that the curriculum is conducive to uh, preparing its students for uh, those board scores. Because again, if you're at the University of Michigan, although the University of Michigan has a great reputation uh, a great school, but if their students aren't passing the boards at a, uh, a high level, that that matter. They're, they're just not going to match. They're not going to match to any residency programs. That's exactly right. I'm curious as you as you kind of think about this, and, and I'm sure getting back to what maybe some of our other listeners might be thinking, it's like, oh well, you're a director of admissions at at a medical school, and don't most medical schools kind of turn people away because they fill their class and. And, you know, it's a very competitive environment. It's, it's not like my program that's a X where I'm struggling to fill the class. How, how, do, you, how do you talk to people about that? Because, I mean, certainly you don't have anything to take for granted here starting at Duquesne because, I mean, it's a brand new program. So, but I know a lot of other medical schools, it's pretty typical to fill the class and, and, and have to close the class because of, of just the nature of the, of the medical degree. Talk about that. That's a great point, Bart. I, you know, what I hope to carry over from the Heritage College, what we do is typically a lot of med schools. Uh, well, first of all, we interview from mid-April to the end of September. And all medical schools are on a rolling admissions. So that old adage that early bird gets the worm. Mm-hmm. And the sooner that you get your applications come complete and are able to follow up with those schools that are on your radar, the more likely it is that you can receive an early interview for early acceptance. There are times where uh, we have to have those tough conversations uh, at the end of the interviewing cycle where we're just interviewing for a wait list only. But we're making those students uh, aware of the fact, you know, before they come in or accept an invitation for interview, you know, it's, it's about setting the proper expectation and making sure that you have those open lines of communication with those students. Also, uh, a part of that is for those students who may not uh, receive an interview or get accepted, or if they interview and they're waitlisted or rejected. I know that rejection is not a PC term, <laughs> but it is what it is. Right. Uh, maybe you're just not accepted for whatever reason. Uh, something that we do here at HCOM that I want to uh, take forward to Duquesne is that have those tough conversations. Why did uh, Susie Smith? get waitlisted or or a not accept and how can we help Susie become a more competitive applicant for the next cycle uh, oftentimes uh, after our interview here at the Heritage College uh, nine times out of ten if a student is waitlisted or rejected they'll talk with me mm-hmm. and during those uh, admission selection meetings I will take copious notes so that uh, anticipating that they'll call in because we encourage them to do so for right. feedback and have those tough conversations. And if they adhere to some of those uh, suggestions from the interviewing committee, from the selection committee, then chances are the following year uh, they are a more competitive applicant. They are uh, uh, a better interviewee uh, the second time around because they know what to expect they have done the, 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 the due diligence in terms of uh, prepping their application, their profile, because they've taken to heart what we have recommended. And that's, that's the same approach I'd like to take with Duquesne, because not everybody's going to make it their first cut. 
Uh, not every pathway into medical school is the same for everyone, and not one is better or worse than the other. Right. I, I, I mentioned um, earlier in the conversation about season, about Duquesne. It wasn't their season to open a medical school those many years ago. It's, their, it's our season now. Same thing with a medical student. I was talking with a student um, who um, is going through our post back program um, who was waitlisted last year. It just wasn't her season. Now it's her season and she is coming into her own. She feels more prepared and confident that she's uh, 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 able to withstand the rigors of the medical, medical school curriculum because right. we had that tough conversation over a year ago and she has taken those things to heart and, have, and has done those things and now she's ready. Yeah. And so those are the things that I'm hoping that uh, I can take uh, with me to the cane and incorporate some uh, a similar similar structure. That's great. And I, I really like, I mean, kind of what I'm hearing a little bit from a marketing strategy and, and communication strategy is the fact that, okay, we're going to approach these students like real people and that, they're, that, that we're going to build valuable relationships, even to the point where we can have hard conversations with them to make their lives better. And I love that. What are some of the other materials or marketing that you're putting together kind of um, from this starting from scratch? I mean, you're going to, you know, service so certainly going to be putting some view books together, some com flows. Tell us a little bit about what's on your plan. Well, uh, gentlemen, I, I, I have to be honest with you. Those are still in the works. Mm -hmm. And actually, our first matriculating class is 2024. Right. Okay. So uh, I have been advised and have been introduced to the marketing team that will be working with Great. our medical school. Specific plans in terms of, obviously, the view books um, and some other ancillary or marketing materials website. Um, those are in the works, but the kind of the uh, uh, the nuts and bolts, the, 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 the meat and potatoes have not been addressed. And I can only speculate uh, or give you uh, the standard, but any uh, nuances or uh, specificity, uh, I couldn't give you at that time because I, I honestly don't know. Cause, uh, well, and that's probably part of what's going to start in July. When you, when you land there, it's like, let's figure this out. So, yeah, Absolutely, absolutely. That's great. <laughs> that's really, really good. We talk a lot about it on the show. Schools are really struggling today to make the same ad spend work. CPMs are up 89% year over year on Facebook and Instagram. Our college clients are no longer looking for rented audiences. They're looking for an own community where they can engage students even before they apply. This is why Zemi has become so crucial for our clients. With over 1 million students, close to 10,000 five-star ratings, consistently ranked as one of the top social apps, and recently, one of Apple's hot apps of the week, there simply isn't anything out there like it, and we have seen it all. Zemi not only provides the best space for student engagement, but the most unique and actionable data for their 160 college and university partners. We know firsthand from our clients that Zemi is a must-have strategy for Gen Z. Check them out now at colleges.zemi.com. That's colleges.zeemee.com. And yes, tell them Bart and Troy sent you. As we bring our episode to a close, we usually ask our guest, Dr. Rice, if there's one piece of advice that they could leave for someone that's in their industry that's sitting in their seat. And for you, it would be a director of admissions at another medical school that has benefited you that you don't mind passing on to them. What piece of advice would that be? That's a great question. And I, and I think I would have to go back to um, a, uh, a coining a phrase from a, um, I was the keynote sp speaker of the SNMA multicultural event uh, gala uh, last month, and one of my talking points was, "Don't let anyone knock your hustle." Mm. And what I meant by that is, whether you come from a rural Appalachia, whether you come from urban, whatever walk of life, there's always going going to be doubters uh, when you share your vision, when you share something. Uh, uh, your your desire, your zeal, if you will, to do something extraordinary. Mm. So you have to be careful who you share those your vision, your dreams with, because although well intended, someone who might be coming from a first generation uh, college background, uh, they might be at a company uh, at a family uh, uh, cookout or holiday dinner, and their uncle who knows everything, who has opinion on everything, but really hasn't lived outside of his bubble, 
will give you the advice that he knows nothing about. Um, and he's doing that out of, out of love, not out of maliciousness, but you have to be very careful of who you share your dreams with because not everybody can receive or will re receive your challenge and your goal of doing something extraordinary beyond their scope. Um, seek wise counsel and never give up because as I mentioned before, not everybody comes to uh, a medical school the same pathway, the same way, the same opportunity. And not one opportunity is better than the other. And I think that um, uh, if they hold on to uh, those things and define their why, uh, why they are going to do what they do, I think that uh, that will bode well for them. And, and, and I don't want to promise pie in the sky. Not everybody's cut out to be a physician. That's why uh, uh, I have a doctorate in higher education administration. <laughs> I have an educational doctorate. Right. There's a reason for that. The chemistries and, and, and Mike Rice and my success and progression in the biochemistry and all that, that was, that was just not my cup of tea. That was not my strong suit. But those who have that educational acumen and that aptitude to do so, maybe you've gotten off to a slow start during your uh, first year or two during your undergraduate years, that's still not necessarily the end of the road. You might have a digger hold it uh, to, to, to climb out of, but it's possible. And uh, one way that uh, uh, those possibilities ex exist is through pathway programs that I'm passionate about. Um, HCOM has uh, a long history of its pathway programs, um, a summer scholars, a post baccalaureate program a summer undergraduate research fellowship uh, uh, summer program. I'm hoping to adopt some of those best practices and move those to Duquesne to provide uh, access and opportunity to those uh, students who may not have had the opportunity to really, really, truly understand that this dream is possible. Dr. Weiss, thank you so much. We wish you all the best and no one's going to try to challenge your hustle and we have, <laughs> <laughs> we have full faith that you will come victorious on the other side of this endeavor. And I know there's a lot of future students that are counting on you and a big leadership team counting on you. So again, thank you for sharing your story. If any of our listeners would like to contact you, what would be the best way for them to do so? Well, I would say um, uh, probably the best way uh, why I'm in tra transition, because I am here at HCOM uh, until uh, mid-June. Uh, so you can contact me at ricem at ohio.edu. That's ricem at ohio.edu. And in between then, you can use my personal email. And that's michaeljulianrice at gmail.com. Very good. Again, Dr. Rice, thank you for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. Bart, what would your last comments be? Yeah, I just want to point out a couple of things that Dr. Rice talked about. And thanks again so much for being on the, on the conversation. One thing I wanted to do is, is, you know, a lot of what Dr. Rice was talking about with challenging, don't let anybody challenge your hustle. I think that can apply to higher ed marketers too, because I know that um, I've often heard people at like, Ethan Braden, a few other ones who we've had on the podcast before, the whole idea of being the drivers of the brand, being the drivers of the messaging, helping people like Dr. Rice be able to do his job well by doing your job well. And I think sometimes uh, sometimes as, as higher ed marketers, we can get into committees with faculty, we can get committees of, of leadership, and everything gets kind of watered down, even though you might know exactly what we need to be doing. Don't don't let other people challenge your hustle. Kind of step up and, and be bold and, and kind of represent the brand and, and make your case. I mean, you don't have to be argumentative, but I think that sometimes standing up and really being able to articulate the why of why something needs to happen. I mean, I love some of the things that Dr. Rice talked about with the ideas of focusing on the relationships. I mean, the idea of, of you know, having dinner at a prospective student's house to get to know their parents and their, and their families and their influencers. What a great idea. And if you were to bring that up at your school right now, what would that be like? But you might know the why is that, you know what, millennials and Generation Z really like that. They love that personal attention. 
you can articulate that. You can pull some data out. You can support that, but don't let anybody challenge that because oh, we've all, we've never done it that way. So I really really love what he said about challenging the hustle, and I really love the idea of really kind of focusing on the relationships because in addition, when you focus on the relationship. I'm reminded, too, of Jim Small from Notre Dame when he talked about storytelling. We really want to make sure that the, the hero of the story is this prospective student. The hero is not your school. It's not your program. It's not your degree. It's the student. And how can you and your school and your recruiters and everyone else involved be the guides that can help them do that, be the guides that speak truth into their life? And what Dr. Rice said about sometimes the guides have to speak hard truth into the life, but at the end of the day, the relationships are what matters, and that's what's going to make success for all of us. So... Thanks again, Dr. Rice. It's been a great episode. Thank you, gentlemen. That concludes our episode for today. The Higher Ed Marketer podcast is sponsored by Taylor Solutions, an education marketing and branding agency, and by Think Patented, a marketing execution printing and mailing provider of Higher Ed Solutions. On behalf of my co-host, Bart Kaler, I'm Troy Singer. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to The Higher Ed Marketer, to ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening with Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to leave a quick rating of the show. Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves. Until next time.